panel discussion. I'll just uh, quickly say a few words and get the uh, panelists uh, started with introduction. Uh, the way, uh, so the broad topic here is, uh, is it uh, agility or is it fragility in disguise? I've been uh, uh, working with agile development for a while. I uh, go around the world, help companies uh, try to implement agile development. And I've developed certain opinions and uh, observations. Fred, please come on in and let's get you a chair. And, uh, okay. and so one of the things uh, that's been really interesting to observe is uh, Agile used to be something that a few companies and organizations tried over the years. But now there is a mass adoption. And, 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 and anything gets to that level, uh, people are going to try different things. One of the things I've observed over the years uh, I'm a programmer by trade, and, and back in time, I remember how we almost endlessly argued if object-orientedness is going to work or not. And it took a long time for us to realize what it is and get better at it. And then as we did, we kind of still are struggling to a certain extent, but most of us have taken the time to learn, try, fail, and then learn. In a, in a way that I see that process goes through a similar transition, where there are people who are successful, then a huge number of people come on in, and then they try, and then they fail, they succeed, and then they learn from their experience over time. But what I notice over uh, several projects that I observe is that companies are trying to be agile, and when I walk into companies, they immediately tell me they're agile. But my concern really is not what they do, but really what they get out of it. Are they succeeding with it? So that's kind of the stage for this particular panel. I'd like the panelists to take a few uh, minutes, uh, uh, introduce themselves, uh, who they are. And while they're doing that, I want you to be thinking about questions. I'm sure the panelists would much rather hear your questions than my canned questions. So uh, I'll let the panelists introduce, come up with your first question as you do. I got a microphone for you when you're ready, so please. So just talk about myself a little bit? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, so I'm Dave Hoover. I live in Chicago. Um, Learned about agile, or extreme programming back in when Kent, a little, probably a year after Kent Beck wrote the white book, and then aspired to be a thought worker for a, a couple years, and then finally slipped in the back door and got to work there for a couple years. Um, after that, um, I couldn't, I can't do the sort of travel rigmarole that, um, that they value and take advantage of so much. Um, so I joined a small consultancy in, consultancy in Chicago. Um, we grew that to about 50 people. I, the company was called Optiva, um, and then it was um, bought by Groupon um, about a year and a half ago. Um, <clears throat> recently left the in a company called Dev Bootcamp, which is a, which is a company that, it's an education-focused company that, that takes uh, kind of novice and dabbler level uh, coders and gets them up to employability in over the course of like two months prep work and then nine week really really immersive learning experience um, and that's what I'm focused on right now I'm very kind of passionate and focused on um, beginner level learning uh, I wrote a book about apprenticeship that I've talked about a couple times at this conference already um, and yeah just just love watching people's light bulbs turn on uh, as they get into software development it's something that I switched into at the age of 25 from a previous career in uh, psychology. That's me. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Rebecca Parsons. I'm the Chief Technology Officer of ThoughtWorks and um, self-proclaimed geek and languages geek in particular. Um, I've been in ThoughtWorks since 1999, uh, so I'm one of the few people with this amount of gray hair that uh, actually got to party on December 31st, 1999, because I only started at ThoughtWorks December 14th, 1999. Wasn't mission critical yet. Um, <laughs> Um, I spend a lot of time now on airplanes, uh, but most of the work that I do for ThoughtWorks um, generally involves um, trying to mediate uh, territorial and organizational disputes between those people called architects and those people called developers um, and try to help them see the world from each other's perspectives. Um, and it's amazing what actually getting them to talk to each other uh, can do for starting to, to uh, smooth the relationship uh, between those individuals. Um, and as, as Dave mentioned, I love to watch the light bulb come on when it's all of a sudden, oh, I, I get this now. <laughs> so that's me. Hi, my name's Jez Humble. I work for ThoughtWorks 2. 
Um, and I've been there since 2006 doing various janitorial roles. Um, I co-wrote a book with Dave Farley called Continuous Delivery. And my job these days is I get hired by companies to rant at people in order to persuade them to overcome the Byzantine organizational problems that prevent them from actually shipping software. And that's me, thank you. Um, in what might be considered a novelty, um, I'm not a thought worker and never have been. Uh, I'm Kevlin Henney. Uh, I work for myself. Um, uh, where Rebecca spends a lot of time on planes, I seem to spend a lot of time in airports being delayed. Um, and uh, I train people, I consult, I write. Um, I think that we have the knowledge to develop great software. It's just that it's unevenly distributed across the profession. We know how to do this. Um, but there's little islands of wisdom. And then there's these um, sort of uh, vast marshes, uh, the dead marshes, in fact, uh, of ineptness and organizational weirdness and all kinds of things. Um, and sometimes when you get the opportunity to sort of cut through that um, and, uh, you know, uh, light the bulbs, even blow the bulbs, you know, it's just, uh, uh, it's absolutely wonderful. Um, but uh, uh, sometimes you worry when you walk out the door that the lights will go out. That's my concern. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Laurent Bossavi out of Paris, France. I'm a freelance uh, uh, consultant and roaming, uh, basically a, f a professional free electron. Um, uh, I still worry that uh, I think my mom is still uh, concerned that I, I need to get a proper job someday. <laughs> um, so maybe, maybe we get to talk about that. Fred. Thank you. Fred George. Uh, I'm a developer. I would say my passion is, over my career has been being an early implementer of new technologies. So I'm never one of the guys who thinks of some of this stuff, but uh, I am one of the guys that will experiment very early with it. Uh, I think lately my passion's sort of been around a post-agile process we call anarchy. Um, as well as microservice architecture being a, a clever way to develop new systems. Uh, but yeah, I love living on the edge and I still write code. Excellent. Uh, thank you for the introduction. You, you have some really passionate people in front of you. We got a definitely passionate audience. So what's on your mind? What do you want to talk about? It's your time. Please, Prakash. Uh, so uh, how do you standardize agility? Like, how do you say if, is there a way to certify that a company is agile? So, so is there a litmus test for agility? Okay, who wants to go first? If you're trying to standardize agile, you do not understand agile. Um, yeah, kind of what Fred said, but uh, um, there is an element that uh, what makes agile tick for me is, um, is actually embedded within the word. Um, it is that it is a responsive approach. Um, it is that it is an adaptive approach. Uh, and therefore, to have a, a prescriptive structure may be a useful starting point, but it is not the end point. It, is not, you know, it may be a stepping stone on, on route to becoming agile, but the problem is you'd have to undertake almost anthropological observations uh, of an organization. Let's see how they're doing it. Let's see what the software is that's coming out. You're going to have to take some very careful observations. I don't think it's um, an easy thing to sort of certify or, 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 or sort of uh, classify and put in a box, um, uh, which obviously makes it very uncomfortable for a lot of people trying to adopt it, because if you can put it in a box, you know where it is. So let's name the beast here and point out that Scrum will offer certifications, but only for individuals, not for organizations. And this is true of a lot of um, certifying kind of things. So who's heard the term cargo cult? Okay, not very many people here, which is unusual. So uh, with your permission, I'll briefly explain. Um, after world, in World War II, the Americans were attacking the Japanese and they established lots of bases in the Pacific Islands uh, and brought lots of stuff and there were people actually living on those islands and they were somewhat surprised to see aeroplanes and foods falling from the sky and lots of things they'd never seen before. 
And after the war, the Americans left, and the people were pretty pissed off because there was no more stuff for them. And so what they did is to try and get the stuff to come back, they built airfields and bamboo control towers and bamboo headphones in an attempt that if they kind of performed all the right kind of rituals, somehow the food would come back and, and all these wonderful things that they'd had. And of course, nothing happened. And there's still cults to this day in the Pacific Islands that are the result of the Americans basically invading these people and then buggering off later. So this is our experience, or my experience, of agile adoption at a lot of companies, is that everyone does the some Scrum certification course for two days. And then suddenly everyone's taking orders, standing up instead of sitting down. And suddenly that big list of work that you can't possibly complete is now prioritized and estimated. And we're all Scrum certified and we're all Agile, yay. Uh, and in fact, that tends not to be the case. And in fact, the important things, um, the hard things, people are like, well, we're adaptive, we're a special company, we're a special snowflake, and some of these practices are not suitable for us because we're too special. And those tend usually to be the hard ones, such as test and development and continuous integration and all the things that actually enable you to achieve uh, learning from your customers through shipping valuable software to them regularly. Yeah, I guess my reaction to, to that question is just why does it matter whether you're agile or not? Like, it's like I think to a lot of people's points like that have been talked about on this, this conference is how long does it take for you to get an idea out to production? That's, to me, that's the measurement. If it's on, on below some interesting threshold, then that's probably more important to be able to say yay yeah, or nay on than you follow some set of <laughs> strange practices or whatever. Just in terms of getting started, uh, I did my first XP project, I guess it was in 98 or 99 around then, and the project manager uh, was explaining, we were explaining some of the practices at that time because it was pretty much a stock XP practice. I think there were only nine at the time. Um, and the team was asking him, this project manager, about which ones do we have to do? And I think he gave the pearl of wisdom here, and it was at this point we're not smart enough to know which ones we can't do. So we need to adopt everything, and as we understand it, we'll get better. Uh, so I would say it doesn't really matter where you start as long as you start, but I would be very prescriptive in how you start. I'd go right grab the Scrum book or grab the XP book or grab some other book that's very prescriptive and do everything until you build that understanding. And then I think you start backing off of them as you don't need them anymore. All right. Who wants to go for the next question? Please. Say your name and uh, ask the question. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I'm Ashita. So my question is, do you think uh, in an ideal agile world, there'll be a world without managers? Because as I understand, even ThoughtWorks has managers. So yeah. I mean, I don't get where that comes from. So. Um, well, it depends on how you define manager. Um, I often hear at Agile conferences um, that you know, um, if we could just do away with all the middle managers, everything would be fine. Um, because there, there is a role uh, for people to handle certain things, and sometimes that means being a manager. Um, just because we probably all at some point or another run into a very horrible manager doesn't mean there's something fundamentally flawed um, about the concept of management in general, although there are some specific roles that, 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 are, that are different. Um, I, I think it's also something of a, of a um, mistake to say how a company organizes its internal finances is the same uh, sh should be applied to to a, a, to a development project. Um, we often get held up as okay, you know, here's this here's this company that that you know knows how to do things. Therefore, you know, if ThoughtWorks has a title manager, therefore that must be okay. Um, we don't have enough time for me to explain <laughs> to you how things actually work in, inside the ThoughtWorks organization. Uh, but I do think the important part of, of thinking about this management role is, just like with any other um, activity within an Agile software development project, what 
what purpose is being served by that position, uh, what value is being generated for the business by this person. And if all this person is doing is shuffling papers one, from one place to another, well, that's what we have computers for. Um, if all they're doing is um, answering questions that could be answered by a dashboard, well, that's what we have dashboards for. Um, but if this person's job is to actually marshal resources across multiple locations and try to make sure that, that logistics are handled, well, there's value in that. So um, in each one of these positions, you look at what is the value that's being delivered to the business, what is the potential enabling of the development team to go off and do their job, what is happening there. Um, I had a, a, a wonderful manager very early in my career who said, my job is to do whatever it takes to make sure you get your job done. And that is my job. You don't work for me, I work for you. And in that kind of definition of management, I think there are many, many uh, roles that can be played there. But fundamentally, it still comes down to what is the value that's being delivered. Uh, just to piggyback on that, um, in terms of I, I don't, you don't work for me, I work for you, I, that's, that's the same pattern I've seen that's worked really well. And specifically, I've seen it work well when you don't have project managers who are literally like engineers' bosses. Like that engineers should report to engineers in terms of like direct reporting and having project managers as a separate discipline that have their own reporting structure. Um, just something I've noticed that works well. Um, so there's a guy called Mike Rother who studied Toyota for a long time. And uh, he wrote some books about the practices that they do at Toyota factories. And what he noticed is that he'd a lot of his customers would adopt the practices, like the Kanban board and the Andon cord, but it would be very cargo cult. And so he wanted to find out how managers at Toyota created this environment where they made these fabulous cars. And so he asked them how they learned to be managers, and they had no idea. There's no formal training to be a manager at Toyota, except that to be a manager, you must first work on the shop floor. And when they build things in Toyota, what they do is they don't create a big plan and then execute it they run a bunch of experiments to work out how to be able to actually build that product. And so your behaviors become habits and your habits become culture. An organizational culture is simply the accumulation of habits of the people who work at that company, which constrains the behavior of the people who work there. And so managers, basically, at Toyota, their job is to create an environment in which the workers can experiment as fast as possible to discover from each other and from their customers. And so for me, that's what managing should be about. So to follow on from that, I think there's a, an important distinction. Um, uh, it goes back to the clarification of the role of manager. Um, in many cases, uh, people who have that title are not managing, they are controlling, which is a very different concept. Um, and there are also uh, people who are expected to provide leadership. Again, management is not necessarily the same thing in most cases. So there are all these subtle shades of meaning. Um, and it's worth clarifying uh, uh, where you stand on this. Now, this idea of um, a manager serving other people in the organization uh, was demonstrated wonderfully by a, a company in Norway and I was uh, sharing a taxi with somebody who works at this company and he, he, he was on the way. We, we were talking about training courses, conferences, workshops and things like that and uh, he said, yeah, I've just been on a course um, and he described the course. It was a management related one and I kind of looked at him because he's a, he's a hard-nosed geek. Um, you know, he, he lives and breathes code and uh, so I was kind of surprised and he said yeah I wanted to see if it was suitable for our managers to go on and he told me before I've actually I visited this organization a number of times um, that very much they have an inverted pyramid structure the people that generate the product create the product and sell the product that's where the money comes from you either create the thing your hardware your software or you're selling it that's where it comes from everything else is in a uh, serves this uh, structure and it's okay to say that, I hear lots of organizations say that, but this was a beautiful demonstration of somebody, a developer, going on a training course that would help the managers understand what they did and would be appropriate, um, not the other way around. Okay, uh, a quick story, which I think ties into some of what's been said before. Um, 
back in the mid 90s there was a, a young developer me <laughs> um, and uh, apparently I was doing fairly well and then one day uh, I got big news I was promoted to management um, now uh, probably up to that point I had this notion that you know the the day you were made a manager uh, that was a bit like sprinkling manager fairy dust on you and uh, somehow you would become you, you were someone who was good at developing and instantly you would become someone who was good at managing um, needless to say I was an absolute disaster uh, at managing one person let alone more than one so uh, I think there's something there that ties to, to the overall theme which is uh, and it's a little like cargo culting uh, it's it's what they call name magic so just before just because you you slap some label on something just before you you just because you say uh, what whatever we are doing we are going now to call it agile or this person who used to be good at this and that thing we're going to call them a manager doesn't make it so so that's I think that's what I wanted to say um, so obviously I've been experimenting with managerless teams for the last couple of companies I've been working with and we'll probably do the same in the next company um, one of the last things I did and I'm a former thought worker as well um, and one of my last presentations in ThoughtWorks was uh, a project without project managers. And in an exercise, in a sort of team exercise, we took the concept of what a manager does and we try to identify the roles they actually really play. And we came up with things like leader and an ambassador, the person who goes and represents your team to other teams to help communicate that. Uh, perhaps a person who goes and talks to a customer. Again, an ambassador is not someone who can make decisions for the country. There are people who are, there are persons who are representing your team to that. They'll bring back what they need to the team and make decisions. Uh, leader, uh, concierge, this guy who's basically doing, getting the materials necessary. We talked about management inversion. That's kind of a concierge role. Uh, and clerk, there's a lot of clerical activities associated with management. And the fact that we were trying to consolidate all these roles into one person and make that a dedicated full-time job just did not feel right. And so we begin to talk about how we tear these roles apart the same way we sort of take architects and, and perhaps different people in the team can assume these sort of roles. Maybe there's someone that's very uh, detail-oriented. Maybe they would make the good clerk. And somebody who communicates extremely effectively, maybe your ambassador. Uh, so we've been experimenting with just basically putting people in a room that have a wealth of talents and allowing them to sort of fit the natural roles without having somebody being designated as manager and sort of by composite have all these things. Uh, and allow the organization to, to basically morph itself. So far, it's working very well. The roles are still being played, but there's no one person doing it called manager. Excellent. I was just wondering as we we're speaking why the light goes on only when you speak. <laughs> so the light bulbs. <laughs> Please. Yeah. Uh, hi. The question I have was like the real crisis we are facing today is because of lack of competence and we are trying to uh, fix that by these practices and methods. Hmm? So shouldn't we, we are in a, a vicious cycle like we, we are not competent to build the software that we are building and it gets more crappier and we put more practices and uh, things to fix that. Shouldn't be the real fix to make people more competent and get into a, uh, a virtuous cycle where things get better. Uh, so is that that is a fantastic question. So the question is, we are, um, we are filling in process to fill the lack of competency we have. Uh, shouldn't our focus be instead to really raise our competency rather than fill it with process? Did I summarize it right? Excellent. The fantastic question, by the way. Please. Uh, I have one thing I wanted to say earlier, and I think it, it ties in well with that question. Uh, so we were discussing uh, agility versus fragility uh, and I've, I've just been reading this interesting book by uh, Taleb uh, which asks the interesting question, what is the opposite of fragility? Okay, could you mention the name of the book? Uh, Anti-fragile uh, and precisely the, that title 
gives the answer away because um, he says the opposite of fragile is not robust, which is what most people would say is the opposite of fragile. Um, he says what fragile means is when you are stressed, you respond with some measure of damage. So if you, this is fragile because I, if I drop it on the ground, it's going to break. Something which is robust is something which I, if I drop it on the ground, is going to stay the same. But the opposite of fragile if, is something that, if it is exposed to stress, will actually improve. So those are interesting categories to think about. Um, for instance, if you, have, if you have a software team or project and something bad happens, it's exposed to stress. How does the project respond to that? And many projects, and I, th I think there, there's a, you could call it a school of thought, when something bad happens, they try to make it more robust. So they add a layer of process, that can often be the case. So if integration is difficult, we put someone in charge of integration. So now we have an integration manager. That word again. Uh, and of course, is that, does that lead to an improvement? No, sometimes it actually makes the whole thing slower and even less uh, robust, let alone anti-fragile. So I think it's uh, correct to identify individual competence, skill, as kind of the, the, the key to anti-fragility in collective efforts. But maybe my colleagues will have more to say about that. Uh, when I was working in ThoughtWorks and actually had project managers, uh, one of the things I would chart our project manager to do is you have two jobs. Your first job is deliver. Your second job is giving back better people. And if you didn't give back better people, you are not getting another project from me. And I think the growth of the people is the almost the most productive thing you can do long term for both your organization and for your projects. Uh, pairing is very effective for this. Uh, I tend to push pairing very hard within my teams. Uh, I like to pair where there is differences between the partners in particular because I am looking to have two better programs at the end of every day. Uh, I think it's well worth the investment and uh, I absolutely agree with you. It's, it's got to be growing the people, not the tools. Um, I think I'll start by observing that all teams have a process. In fact, all teams have at least one process. Some teams have many processes. And in certain bureaucratic organizations, they definitely have the process we say we're doing and the one we're actually doing. Um, the process, what we mean by process is simply an answer to the question, who's doing what, why, where, and when? Um, and it may be a formalized thing. It may be very, very loose. Um, and so there, we can sort of see there is a spectrum between big P process that we get from a book versus little P process is a much less formal thing. Um, so when people layer process or add process, they're tending towards this end. Um, uh, what I'm interested in and what I interpret in the context of the word agile and indeed in the context of the manifesto and when you read carefully things like the Scrum book, uh, XP and so on, um, that most of these are about increasing team awareness and individual awareness and organizational awareness on a good day if the wind is in the right direction. In other words, it's about awareness. What are we doing? Most people just do the same thing without being aware of it. Um, it's not a question of whether you're doing the thing it says in that book or the thing it says in that book. Is do you know what you're doing and do you have a good reason for doing it? And if you were to change, how would you go about doing that? And, and so on. Um, and when you look more deeply into these, they're all about again, increasing the skill and the competence of the team as a team and the individuals within that team. Um, the idea is that the, the, the process that you want is the one that improves the people because otherwise, well, you take away the process and the people are exactly as they were before. They're left in an unimproved state. Um, so there's a couple of points about that, uh, which I guess I covered in a talk on, oh, it seems so far back in time, Thursday. Um, and I'll be covering again in a talk later on, so I can plug something in the future here. Um, 
but uh, where actually there's a wonderful illustration of the importance of skills and competence making a fundamental um, uh, uh, difference to how people will deliver and their ability to engage with the rest of the organization. So I was talking to Laurent yesterday um, about this whole skill thing. And um, I've been reading a book recently called Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Paulo Freire, which he was a Brazilian in the 1960s. And he basically identified that the model of education we have is that it's called the banking model. The students are empty vessels in which we pour knowledge. And they're the res passive receivers of knowledge. And this is still the model of education in most places. And when we join companies, the job of the companies is to suck that knowledge out of us and turn it into products which we can then sell to people. And this is fundamentally broken. And effectively, it's a means by which um, kind of patriarchal societies continue to oppress us. Um, and I think what all of us are seem to be saying is that actually what we want to do is learn from each other and, and, and develop our skills and learn from our customers. Um, uh, and so this needs a fundamental change in approach in culture in the way we see um, learning and, and skill acquisition and knowledge acquisition. So I don't have any answers to that. I'll also point out that, that I, I do think um, at first, as, as, as uh, Kevin pointed out, everybody has a process. It depends on whether the process is actually um, helping or hindering. Um, and I think one of the things, particularly when you talk about the growth of individuals, is the importance of feedback. And you know, I very often get in conversations with, with um, development managers in large corporations who say, well, Agile works fine if you have all of these you know, top-notch programmers, but you know, I can only afford to hire average people, and so I need the waterfall process, which has all of these gates. And if you actually look at it from a systems perspective and look at the feedback cycles that are built into a waterfall process, the poor individuals have no ability to learn about the mistakes that they've made because any feedback comes so disconnected from the activity that they're performing that they have no ability to learn. And I think that if you start to analyze, okay, what is, if my goal is in fact to grow my people, what do I need? Well, they need some ability to know whether they've done it right or whether they've done it wrong so that they can learn from that. And so looking at it from a systems perspective and saying I'm going to construct a process that gives feedback such that people can actually learn and improve, then that is a much more productive process uh, for competency development than one that so completely disconnects the feedback cycle from the activity that people have no chance. Hi, I'm Vidhi. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, what problem we are facing currently is uh, customer are always in hurry and they want product very fast. So do you think agility can solve that problem? So is speed something that agile can solve? So the question was, um, the customers always want more features faster. Can agility solve that problem? Um, no. Uh, in my opinion, I don't think agility can solve that problem. Um, I think what agility can do is help those people get more data on whether the things they want are actually useful. Um, the biggest problem, in my opinion, is that people have, especially people who have ideas about creating products, the natural human psychological instinct is to think about the amazing products that you're going to build and how many fabulous features it has and how much everyone is going to love it and all the great things you're going to be able to do with it. Whereas in fact, nobody cares about your product. And people just want to solve their problems. And uh, people get, you know, product owners, and I have been a product owner and I've been very guilty of this. You don't think about that. You, you get carried away with how amazing your fabulous idea is. And I think what we need is a process by which we can you know, bring reality to those people as fast as possible so that they don't get carried away with these ideas. Because most, I mean, many studies have been done on this. More than 50% of the features that we build are either never used or rarely used. 
never, so zero value features. So we could be working half the time that we're working at the moment and spend the rest of the time in Goa if only we knew which of the features we were building is zero value. But we don't. Because we build these fam fabulous requirements documents based on these wonderful ideas we're having, and then it takes us ages to actually build it. And then often we go off and do something else before we even find out if the product returns, uh, produced a return on investment over its life cycle. That number is rarely recorded. We're so focused on cost and how much it's going to cost to develop something. But actually, if we get a a great revenue stream, a great return on our investment, the cost doesn't matter. If the cost is important, what you're building is of marginal value and you shouldn't bother. You should put your money into unit trust instead. So actually, we need to get a lot better. I mean, Agile will help you get, you know, if you can convince people, let's deliver a tiny increment and run an experiment to find out if the idea is valuable and get feedback on that. That's where agility will help you. But you have to be able to convince them only to build you know, a month's worth of stuff or less. Now, we were just debating, Laurent and I, that we seem to be agreeing too much. So, so Jess said no, so I'm going to say yes, <laughs> just to be provocative, but I'm going to copy and paste most of his answer. Uh, um, if you, uh, because, uh, um, do agile practices do this? Well, this relates to the, uh, the discussion earlier. Um, possibly not. If you are agile, and it's definitely going, it's worth going to look it up in a dictionary. Don't read all the blogs on agile development. Look up the original word. Um, if you are genuinely agile, yes, it will address this. Um, you will be responsive and appropriate. You will be able to change the mind of the people that um, uh, uh, that are in the whole product cycle, um, for exactly the reasons that Jez described. Um, but it does require that you are actually agile rather than doing agile which is a very different thing, because Agile is not a thing you can do. You can be it, but you can't do it. Um, so I, I'm going to sort of come at it from that other angle. And exactly uh, what Jez said about all of these unused features, um, this question of speed. I have a client, and we, I visit them a couple of times a year, and we talk about features that they're eventually going to have, and we sit around, and we, 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 we talk about them, and we throw some code around, and we design bits and pieces, and yeah, fine. And eventually comes crunch time, and they say, we don't have the time to do this. But you've had 18 months, what were you doing? You have more time than any other company I know, because other companies would have actually had to ship something by now. But you don't have the time, because you, know, you have a, a product that is over 100,000 lines long, which should actually, according to my calculations, be between five and 10,000 lines long. You should be able to deliver new features of the order of weeks, not of the order of halves of years and years. So when you say you don't have enough time, I beg to differ. You have more time than anybody else I've ever met because you're able to squander it and spend it so unwisely. I just want to add one story. This phone is powered by an ARM chip. The ARM chip was developed in the early 1980s by two people, and it took 18 person months of effort to develop it. And the manager of that team said, I gave these two people something that Intel could never give their employees. No time and no money. I'm not entirely sure that's going to be a really useful lesson for the, for the, for, <laughs> for the people who run organizations here. They're going to go back Monday. Right, no pay. <laughs> and I want it delivered by the end of Monday. They weren't unpaid. Um, but. <laughs> Um, I, let me talk from just personal experience. I've been writing code now for 45 years. Um, I would say the largest increase in my productivity came when I started adopting the small talk style of programming uh, that you know Ward Cunningham and those people have championed. Uh, the agile process comes out of the same guys doing the same stuff. So I wouldn't say necessarily that it was the agile that made it faster, but right now I'm way more efficient coding than I've ever been in my career. Uh, a lot of it being the, the small talk style of programming plus the agile practices. I am the most efficient program right now I've ever been. One of, one of the things I learned, um, just in terms of uh, customers who always want more and just are constantly like asking for the next thing uh, and rushing you, um, just in, in the years that I was at Optiva, I definitely learned about expectation management. <laughs> it's just, just being conservative with what you're saying, even, even if it disappoints them up front and then over-delivering on just the kind of 
more conservative estimates and, and expectations. Um, and, and one of the things I learned in the process was by starting with, you know, some of these, or, or maybe a lot of these XP and Agile practices, they, they're often like, I could, you can use them as a means to establishing trust, and then once that trust is established, something magical happens, and estimates matter less, and all sorts of things matter less. Um, and yeah, that's just something I learned along the way. It's just like sometimes the process is just kind of a means to establishing trust, and then a lot, a lot, of, a lot of the game changes after that. So, so I think uh, one, of, one of the things I would like to add to this is, um, what I've noticed is there's, there's a balancing act. Uh, we know as programmers what we often do. We like to just sit there and fiddle with code. And then we spend $500, $1,000 doing something that we think is really great. And is this really valuable to the business? Sometimes we tend to forget it. So when customers say we want to get there in a hurry, I'm not taking that as drop everything and run, but to think about what your real priority is. So imagine for a minute that you're sitting in a, a taxi and you're telling the driver, go faster, go faster. So he does. But at some point, the driver slows down. And you say, go faster. And he says, no, I won't, because there's a curve ahead of me. And if I go faster, we both are going to end in a ditch, and I'm not ready to lose my car over it. So the real point is, you are the driver, and that's the customer. And sure, you don't want to ignore the customer, but I think it's kind of, we got to use the common sense and say, no, here's the time. Slowing down actually is going to increase our speed. But yes, we are going to focus on and I'm not going to stop in my brother's place on the way, but I'm going to actually focus on your work. So I think there's a balancing act, I think. That's the way I look at it. So it's kind of going back to this. It's yes and no together. I think it depends. But I think it's, uh, it's what our focus is and, and just to reprioritize things and, and uh, you know, let us uh, eliminate waste and focus on doing the right things. Any? Uh, yep, yeah, please. Um, hello, I'm Niranjan. Uh, I have actually two questions. Um, so how do you see about the future of Agile across the world, maybe in the next 10 years? And second about the software organizations who have still not started following Agile practices. So will there be no escape or they can still work smartly? Um. I have no crystal ball, um, so, but I do think that um, one of the things that we are seeing is Agile, um, not just in software development, but people starting to think about, you know, can we take these principles, not the practices necessarily, but the principles, and what does that mean in the context of a legal department? What does that mean in the context of a marketing campaign? What does that mean even in the context of the accounting department. Um, we actually had our auditors come in a, a couple of years ago and they were shocked that there were no cubicles in our finance department. And the entire finance team sits in an open table and they have a stand up every morning so they all know what's happening and, and they're talking next to each other just like people on a development team. You overhear a conversation, oh wait a minute, I know what was happening with that. Um, the auditors were, were astounded. They were a little nervous about the fact that they might have to sit at the same table, and so we gave them an office. But I do think you're going to see um, these principles being spread further throughout organizations as people realize you know, it's not just software um, that is now going to have to respond more quickly, but our business models are changing more rapidly. The way we think about it, the relationship with our customers are changing more rapidly. All of these things are changing, and therefore all of those other aspects of our organizations have to change. So I think you're going to see uh, things continuing. Um, I also think that um, one of the things that, that, that Fred mentioned earlier, first you have to start being very prescriptive if you don't know enough to know what you don't have to do. Um, we are starting to see many organizations who are getting more mature in their understanding of the Agile principles, and I think you're going to see a lot more innovation in some of the ways these things are applied as you get more and more people uh, comfortable with, uh, with what these principles mean, how those principles um, correspond to practices that might manifest them, how does that apply in my particular situation. So, my crystal ball is no good, but that's what I think. Uh, I have the same lack of crystal ball, um, but I, I have good news and bad news. Um, the good news is that 
much of what we call agile will continue to increase in its um, adoption and its uh, the cultural shift it brings to um, new companies, um, small companies, and organisations beyond this. Um, whether it continues to be called agile or not is a separate question. People will, um, uh, uh, we many of these principles that we discuss have been around for a while, and it's a little bit like uh, the tide coming up the beach. Each wave brings. The, the line a little further up the beach. And I sort of sense that there at the core, something is happening and that will continue to be the case. And in 10 years time, um, a number of the people who may have formed the core of the Agile community will not be doing what they call Agile. They will have moved on to something else and it will be the next wave up the beach. Um, I think that's kind of the good news. The bad news is um, most companies will never become Agile. It's just not gonna happen. It's not gonna become an industry dominant paradigm. Um, uh, although we are very keen on it and a number of people advocate it, we are in, unfortunately in an echo chamber here in the sense that uh, we are the people that are interested and there are a lot of companies that are interested. But as a percentage of the people producing software, I'm afraid it's not a very big percentage. There are a lot of large organizations that will need to die off before this becomes dominant. It's the dominant interesting paradigm, but it's not the dominant paradigm. It's not the way that people, most people are developing software around the planet. Most of those people don't go to conferences. They don't read books. There's a lot of things they don't de do. Um, so. Uh, I will say that doesn't actually trouble me that, that much because I like the good news version. I, I like the, the fact that I can see a change. Um, but uh, I don't think it's going to become um, the default approach. Um, and I would love to be proven wrong. Um, you know, but uh, in the absence of a crystal ball, I'll pass it on. So, as Kevin hinted earlier, my tactic to make the panel more interesting uh, because panels tend to be a little boring, uh, is to disagree with whatever was said. Even though, you know, I kind of agree with the, the notion that we cannot predict the future, we don't have a crystal ball. But then I always remember this quote by Alan Kay, uh, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. Uh, so I, I think a good way to think about the long-term evolution of Agile is in terms of are we actually steering this thing where we want it to go, or are we just, uh, you know, along with the ride, following along, uh, being carried by the flow? So, and, and how can we be more in charge if we're so far just along for the ride? Uh, one of the interesting thoughts that occurred to me recently was the way Agile was redefining professions within the software industry. So we used to have uh, titles, designations of, of specialties that corresponded to, uh, interestingly, the phases of the waterfall. We used to have analysts and uh, programmers who were not doing any analysis uh, and testers. So, and those uh, roles over the past 10 or 20 or 30 years have evolved quite a bit. Uh, so now we have, we, there, there was a transitional phase when one of the titles was analyst programmer or programmer analyst. So it kind of a merging of, of two roles. And then after a while we started calling those developers instead. Hence, so, so software developer became a thing. Uh, now we have new roles, new specialties that have emerged uh, as, a, as a consequence of the spread of Agile development. Uh, things like product owner, you can now see uh, job positions with the title product owner. I think that's an interesting evolution. So is this something that just happens and that we have no control over it? I don't think so. I think we can... Um, uh, make some informed guesses as to how uh, responsibilities shift within an industry. Uh, we can learn about that, for instance, from sociology. So that's one, one case of uh, taking insights from other uh, disciplines and better understand how things are going in ours. Uh, and my hope is that if we understand better uh, those kind of things, which some, some people may call that politics. 
and, and there's kind of a sense within the tech community that we should be, you know, we should be completely detached from any kind of power or identity politics. And uh, there is a, a sentiment uh, I've heard from a few people which summarizes as, oh, shut up about all, all that process and all that agile thing and let's just go back to programming. It's just shut up about it and just do it. And I, th I, can, I can sympathize to some extent with that sentiment, but I certainly disagree with it. Uh, I think it's important to understand what's going on in our profession, how it's changing, how it's evolving, so that we can steer that future. I think I'll also disagree in terms of, uh, I do think Agile is, is going to be more broadly ex uh, accepted in the industry. Uh, I think as I look at the uh, majority of CTO and CIO positions being filled, uh, companies are looking to have Agile as, as something these guys can espouse and have experience in, which means a key enabler is being put into organizations. We have to understand a, a shift in technology, whether it's a process technology or product technology, are long processes. You know, 25 years is a very fast shift. The only industry that beats that is pharmaceuticals. Uh, Look how long COBOL stays around. Look how long uh, you know, Java will stay around uh, after its beginnings, even though at this point it's not the best choice. So I think we're in, in, the, in the upside of still a large increase in, uh, in Agile, but you know, you'll see a lot more shops in 10 years, but there'll still be other waterfall shops. Um, I want you to keep the microphone. I want to wrap this up, but with one question that I'm going to ask. The panel obviously has a very broad experience working in observing several companies. So I'm going to time this. you got about, let's say, uh, approximately two minutes each. Um, what have you observed that companies are doing extremely well, and they should continue to do it? And what have you seen that they do too poorly, are not doing it at all, and they better get their act together and change? So with you, uh, Fred. Well, let's talk about what they're doing poorly. I think they're doing a very poor job of training their programmers. Uh, and, and building these poly-skilled workers. Uh, I think they are doing a good job of understanding software is core to their business and it's getting you know, first priority at the CIO level. And I'll give up the rest of my time. Yeah. All right, I have to take a rain check on what companies are doing very well. <laughs> um, but yeah, maybe, maybe after I say what they're doing sure. poorly. Uh, and we, actually, we could actually make that a poll. Um, Go so, are most of you programmers? Okay, so I want to ask, uh, I want to ask a tough and maybe uh, annoying question, uh, which is, uh, raise your hand if in the past six months you have interacted directly with an end user of your product. Uh, okay, that's too few. Uh, in the past 12 months? All right. So that's one thing that I think most companies are doing extremely poorly, uh, get what, what we call uh, getting out of the building, uh, talking to, uh, going wherever your product is being used and uh, having a look at that. I think overall, uh, we're doing, companies are doing well at realizing that software is important and realizing that skills development is an important thing. Uh, they, may, they may be going about it wrong uh, in, in the sense that Dave Hoover uh, observed as companies, employers tend to act as skill vampires, basically. You know, they drain skill from their employees and are not much concerned with uh, creating new, sorry. <laughs> That you know, that struck me as such a you know such a uh, striking way of thinking about it. I can't help. Um, but I think I think companies do realize that skill is key. So that's at least one positive thing that we can build on. Uh, well, Laurent said. Uh, well, actually, more broadly, I think it's an, it's a big. It depends because um, companies are not uniform. Although there are certain sort of there's a certain group think across certain classes of company um, 
they're not uniform. Some companies are very good at um, uh, breaking down what we perceive as traditional barriers, the way they co-locate people. Um, uh, and the way that they interact with the, the people who are going to use the product or, uh, or what have you. Some are very good at that, and some are, abs some are absolutely terrible at that. Uh, at the same time, some are very good with the skills recognition and indeed the skills growth. And at the same time, there are other companies who aren't, and they're exactly you know, it's the opposite. Um, I think one of the most depressing, one of the most depressing uh, training experiences I had was um, for a company where I ran a series of courses over a number of years and I did it um, and I was signed up to do some consultancy for them but that didn't come through because the person left and it turns out that after five or six years when I went back to this company there was not a single person there who knew that I had previously been there in, uh, uh, there was no continuity I arrived one day and we went out to the pub for lunch and there was a newcomer on the team and he was a little depressed by the fact that this was the leaving drinks for two people, and he'd just arrived. Um, this company was very, very poor at understanding its people and what they needed. And it wasn't just throwing a little bit of training at them every now and then. That wasn't going to cut it. So I see examples both ways, and I'm, I'm loath to generalize across the whole industry because it's quite large, quite complex, and there are lots of dark areas we never hear about, like some of those COBOL programmers we keep talking about. Yeah, for the whole time you've been speaking, I've been really struggling to try and find things that companies are doing well. Uh, and so far, I've come up with consuming resources, um, offering employment to middle class people, um, and, you know, selling things. Um, that's kind of where I've got to so far. And those that sound very positive. So maybe I'm just in a very depressed mood. I don't know. I feel quite happy. Uh, or maybe I've just been talking to all the wrong companies. This is what happens when you become a consultant. People don't hire consultants when they're doing fabulously well. They hire consultants when things are going very badly wrong. And ThoughtWorks is expensive, so we get the companies who are really, really, really desperate. So, you know, maybe I'm just, you know, uh, exposed to the wrong kinds of companies. I, I would say, I think, the thing that's exciting me most, uh, to reframe the question, is um, the lean startup kind of approach, which is basically what Laurent said, which is actually go and talk to your customers and find ways to satisfy their needs. So that's something that I'm, I'm excited and, and happy about uh, because I think it will lead to um, more efficient consumption of resources and better distributed employment and the involvement of more people in actually creating a better world, which would be fabulous. Um, so more of that, please. Uh, like Jez, I was struggling with what uh, companies universally are doing well. Um, so I cling to some bright spots. Um, I was, in fact, talking to a very old established insurance company in Australia who had just realized that they were no longer in the insurance business, that they were in the software business. And what used to be the positive differentiator for them in the market, which was their complex underwriting model, was now a liability. And if I can see more examples of companies making that shift, you know, I, I do think that's important. Uh, I do think, again, there are bright spots where people do start thinking about it's not the people who are proxies for your users that matter, but your real users. And that's another bright spot. Um, one of the things, unfortunately, that I still see pretty universally going wrong, um, and I think it's somewhat human nature, is the silver bullet. You know, there is this magic tool, there is this magic language, there is this magic process, there is ma this magic insert your favorite now and here that in companies. So one thing that I've seen that I'm, in, I'm impressed about um, in, the, in the kind of smaller world and smaller community of Ruby, um, I think automated test suites are pretty standard. And that's, when I first learned test-driven development, that seemed extremely radical to me. And I didn't think I'd get to the point where I would be able to switch projects frequently and continue to see a test suite sitting there waiting for me. I'm not saying the tests are great, um, we still have to, we still have, I think a lot, all of us have a lot to learn about writing good tests, but um, I'm, I've been happy with that. I, I don't, know how, I don't know, how, know how prevalent it is outside of the Ruby community, but it is very prevalent within it in my experience. So that's been nice. Um, what Laurent was saying about um, skills 
production versus consumption is definitely uh, my hot topic. Um, I, you know, I, I think companies do a poor job of producing skill, and they're in the really horrible habit of just simply consuming it. And you can see that when there's people in India and in the U.S. who are are nearly employable but unemployable, and that's because the companies are, have too strict definitions of what entry level means and, and, and things like that. Um, and that, yeah, so I think that I think overall, I, th I can't probably can speak a little bit generally and universally that companies are doing a poor job of being skill producers. With that, we conclude this. Please give a hand to the speakers, uh, panelists. Thank you. You have to say something? Yes, please. Here's, yep. Uh, you see, I don't have a crystal ball, but my technology radar is very nice. Uh, I heard of Agile. Uh, man, man, no, I heard no. I just saw. I received a survey at the COOP 2001, and uh, they asked me to evaluate uh, the conference. Then I was, I haven't, uh, it was just the beginning. I said, oh, the best thing here is this title from Alistair Coburn. Okay, and then uh, I saw they will be successful, very successful until now. What I want to remind you is that self-organization permeates all the universe. Even minerals self-organize. So, naturally, uh, complex human beings uh, uh, will self-organize more easily. As the guy said, patriarchal society is the problem. But the new generation is born, is born agile. 50% of Americans are born outside uh, families. 20% of Indians are divorcing, and so on. So, uh, new generation is agile. They won't put up uh, with being uh, robots in, in, in a Toyota company uh, to produce cars. They'll be more interested in public transportation and things like this, a sustainable society. So I think uh, 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 Agile uh, touched the nerve of self-organization. And it will become better and better if the guys are wise. Thank you very much.